Praise the Lord, God's children, because this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Welcome to the Master's Word. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie, and I want to announce that the Master's Touch Healing School is now broadcasting classes for anyone who wants to join in daily. These uh, classes are available every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 3 p.m. due to my schedule. <laughs> And I say daily, but it is. It's Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 3 p.m. And I'll be giving you the particulars later on in this program, but realize that it does come on Spreaker.com. It'll be right here on this radio station. My friends, all Master's Word programs are Christian Internet, radio, and TV talk shows directed at educating, edifying, and helping the body of Christ to gain understanding of God's Word and to know just who they are in Christ Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, just overflowing through our lips. We praise you, we love you, and we adore you, and we thank you, Lord, that as we seek you in your kingdom, you always illuminate your word so that we'll gain proper understanding of it. We thank you for the rhema word of God, for revelation, knowledge, and manifestation of your word in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. And we thank you for the gift of utterance, and bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as we endeavor to know you more intimately and love you more deeply. Oh, Lord, we love you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to take over this broadcast right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, did you come expecting to receive? If you don't expect to receive from God, you won't. So get that expectation level elevated. When you do, you'll come away from every broadcast, every church visit, Bible study, or whatever with more head and heart knowledge. So my brothers and sisters, whatever your need or desire when you pray or join in a meeting of any kind, or even when you're just reading the Bible, expect to receive and you will. Now today we're going to be taking another look, continued look I should say, at entering in God's, into God's rest. And we're going to talk about resting in the finished work of Jesus again. You know, these are the most dangerous times that the human race has ever encountered. We will need to rest in the finished works of Jesus Christ like never before. God has already made his divine favor available to those who will place all of their trust in what Jesus has already done. And uh, we know that salvation is a free gift from God. We can never earn our salvation through our works, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. We are saved by grace through faith. And we received all of God's provision the same way that we received our salvation, by faith. What happened? Well, we heard the word on salvation and we believed it and we were saved. <laughs> and most of us didn't experience an instant change in our actions once we were saved. However, as we remained steadfast in faith concerning our salvation, our actions began to change, didn't they? Through faith, our actions began to reflect the change that took place on the inside of us. Now, as I told you on Monday, it's going to take faith to take possession of all of God's grace. We access the grace of God by faith. Romans 5, verses 1 through 2. Faith comes from the Word of God. Therefore, we have to know the Word in order to take possession of what it says. Romans 10, 17. Now, let's talk about resting in the results of the resurrection for a minute. God has a will for your life. He has a will for all of our lives. However, just because... Just because he has a will for each of us doesn't mean it's going to automatically come to pass. Nothing just happens, my friends. God's will is for us to live long, successful lives. However, we will not see these promises manifest in our lives if we don't believe him. It was not God's will for the Israelites to spend 40 years in the wilderness. They couldn't make progress. Why? Because they didn't believe God. Oh, they believed in him. They quite simply didn't believe him. God's will for our lives is good. However, it will not manifest on its own. Our faith and belief are required to reach the next level that God has for us. Faith will not work until the will of God is known. And how do we find the will of God? We find it in His Word. You see, the will of God is the Word of God. Now, we spoke before on the Sabbath and its meaning. Remember, Sabbath means rest. And the rest is referring to God's finished works. Hebrews 4, verses 3 through 8. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For six days he worked, on, worked, and on the seventh day he rested. Hebrews 4, 4. Genesis 2, 2 and 3. Rest, is in this particular context, then, means to cease from work because everything is done. Not because you're tired, but because the work is done. Man was created right before the Sabbath. At that point, God had provided everything man would ever knew and, and ever need, including the ability to reproduce. 
Now, our evidence is found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 5, 11, and 22, and also Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11 in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 15, tell us that today there's a rest we can enter into. However, faith and obedience are still required to enter into God's rest. So just what does this Sabbath rest tell us? It tells us that God wants us to have a confidence in Him, in that all, all, everything that He's already done and He's put into place for us. And resting on the Sabbath is symbolically recognizing that God is our real and only source, not our own work our jobs, or anything that we do. How do we know? Our evidence is found in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, and Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. Look all those scriptures up, my friends. Do your homework. So the bottom line, then, that we discovered is that God's rest describes our relationship with Him. You see, trusting and relying on Him and what He's already done instead of relying on our own abilities and talents and works is what is necessary. So what's our reality uh, of the Sabbath? In, in, in symbolism. What is, what is, what's our reality in it? Jesus. See, we've all, we have all of the Sabbath rest in Jesus the Christ. You see, through Jesus we can have a relationship with God we couldn't have before because we were separated from God by our sin. But now, through Jesus Christ, we can have a relationship with God and have all of our needs met. And when we are resting, we are trusting in what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have everything we need within our born-again spirits, my friends. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Our instruction is to labor to enter that rest. That's all we have to do here. That's our job for God. To only labor to enter that rest. Praying, serving, studying the Bible, confessing the Word, and listening to the Word of God. Based uh, All those word, word, word of God based messages are all ways in which we build our faith and walk in obedience to God and His will. Our Christian walk should only consist of entering into God's rest. Instead of trying to work to make Him do something that lines up with our will. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 8 through 11 is our evidence for that. So, the rest that God has made available for believers today is not referring to physical rest, but an inward attitude, a complete trust and confidence in God. We rest in Him by trusting in everything He has accomplished for us through Jesus. We know we're resting uh, in God when we are uh, have ceased to trust in our own abilities. N now, granted... I know what talents I have. I know my capabilities, my own limitations in the physical realm. All right? But I know that with God, all things are possible. And because I have Christ in me and I'm in Him, I can do anything. See, all the finished works of God is within us now. 2 Corinthians 5.17 The enemy doesn't want us to enter God's rest, so he uses fear and condemnation to keep us from entering that rest. When we speak words of doubt, we're agreeing with Satan and causing ourselves to be defeated. We are actually lining ourselves up with defeat and receiving it into our lives. Now we discussed how we enter God's rest. Remember in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 9 through 10 it tells us that in giving the Israelites the land of Canaan, God promised them that he would go before them and defeat all of their enemies in order for them to live securely there. All that was required of them was to fully trust in him and his promises. Enter his rest. However, they refused to obey him. Instead, they murmured and complained against him. They went so far as to yearn to go back to their bondage under the Egyptians. The particular rest referred to here was that of the land of Canaan. Into that rest, God solemnly declared that the Israelites who disobeyed him would never enter. Hebrews 3.11 God war he, you know, he warned them. He entreated them. He had caused his mercies to pass before them. And he had even punished them with judgments, all in vain. So finally, he declares that for all the rebellion that they had done, they will be excluded from the promised land. And you'll find that in Hebrews 3, verses 16 through 19. Now eventually, the next generation did place their faith in God, and by following the leadership of Joshua some 40 years later, entered into God's rest, the land of Canaan. Both the Hebrew Christians and us are admonished in Hebrews 4, 1. Listen to this. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it, the promise, the promise that still stands for us today is the promise of salvation through God's provision, who is Jesus the Christ. He alone can provide the eternal rest of salvation through his blood shed on the cross for the remission of sins. And God's rest then is the spiritual realm. It's in the spiritual realm. It's the rest of salvation. Faith is the key to entering God's rest. You see, the Hebrews had, had had the gospel preached to them just as the Israelites knew the truth about God. But the messages were... 
of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Hebrews 4.2 Now some had heard the good news of Christ, but you know what? They rejected it because of lack of faith. That's right. So what is this rest? This is where we left off. Well, in Hebrews 4, we can learn more about what this rest is and how we can enter into it. Let's jump right into the passage. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in, da in David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would have not had afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore, I mean, so, I'm sorry, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Well, what the heck is he talking about? I mean, well, one thing is clear. He's saying that the blessing of God's rest is available to us today. He actually points this out to us three times in verses 1, 6, and 9. His point is that although the Old Testament spoke of two rests, it also clearly spoke of another future and greater rest that God's people could enter into. Now there was the weekly Sabbath rest, rest from physical labor, on Saturdays that we find in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, which says that God rested after his creation of the earth, not because he was tired, but because he was finished with the work. And the Israelites were invited to enter into God's creative rest by not working on Saturdays and trusting that God would provide for them. In a world of subsistive living, one of living of, in survival mode constantly, which the wilderness begged, this resting on Saturday was unheard of. <laughs> I mean, hey, yet as the Israelites expressed faith in their God, in this way it was a testimony to their other nations that their God was real and powerful and faithful to all of his people. But this wasn't the only rest God offered Israel in the Old Testament. He also offered them the promised land and rest from their enemies. He said he would go before them and defeat their enemies so that they could live securely in the land he had given them in Deuteronomy 12, verses 9 and 10. All they had to do was trust him and go into the land, and he would protect them so that they could settle in in that land and live comfortably and securely. Now, as we learned last week, the Exodus generation forfeited this rest because they refused to trust God's promise by going into the land. But the subsequent generation did trust God, and following Joshua, they entered this rest. But even this wasn't the ultimate. Uh -uh. This wasn't the ultimate rest that God offered his people. Nope. 400 years later, with the Israelites living securely in the land, David in Psalm 95 speaks of yet another rest that God's people may enter. This implies that a greater Joshua, the Hebrew version of the Aramaic Jesus, would provide a greater rest, the rest of salvation that the Messiah would offer when he came. Both of the previous rests pointed to and foreshadowed this messianic rest. Now, Jesus, the Messiah, has come, and his rest, the rest of salvation, is available to everyone who comes to him. Jesus spoke of this rest in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What a beautiful image. He calls out to people who are weary from trying to pull the loads that are too heavy for them. He's obviously not speaking of physical loads, but rather the burden of living in this broken world by our own inadequate resources. He says that he's able to pull this load because he's strong and he invites us to get into his yoke by coming to him and learning from him. If we'll do this, we'll experience rest for our souls, the wonderful blessing of his presence and power enabling us to pull this load. Now, Remember that a yoke, I have said this before, a yoke is, is what they put uh, two animals into, like oxen or horses, uh, to pull like a plow or something. Uh, and this is so that they will work in tandem. They'll work together and they'll move together. And whenever they go, if one goes, the other one goes. That's what we're supposed to do with Jesus. All right. You know, F.B. Meyer describes this rest in, in this way. 
To all of us, Christ offers rest, not in this next life only, but also in this life. Rest from the weight of sin, from care and worry, from the load of daily anxiety and foreboding. The rest that arrives from handing over all worries to Christ and receiving from Christ all we need. Have you entered into that experience? What a shame it would be to have this kind of rest offered to us and not take advantage of it. This raises the obvious question, how do we enter this rest? Well, the author's already told us that the key to entering God's rest is faith, believing in his promise of provision. But what does this faith look like? I mean, the rest of Hebrews chapter 4 answers this question. Verses 10 through 13 explain the essential nature of this faith. And verses 14 through 16 explain the proper object, object of this faith. So let's take a look. Chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, explains faith's essential nature. And listen closely, this is the hardest part to get. Chapter 4, verses 10 and 11 says, For he who has entered his rest, capital H, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Okay, faith involves both ceasing from your works and making every effort. This sounds like a nonsensical paradox to me, like the Buddhist cone, think, the sound, think of the sound of one hand clapping. I mean, hey. <laughs> but this isn't the case, my friends. Uh -uh. There's a sense in which biblical faith involves both passivity and effort. It requires passivity in the sense that you stop depending on your own resources and depend instead on God's resources. Faith is saying, I cannot do this, only God can do this. Yet it requires effort to choose to depend on God. See, we instinctively rely on our own efforts and resources instead of God's. And this is the heart of what it means to be fallen. That's why we say so often, I got ahead of God, I got out in front of God. We don't want to do that. Let God lead. He's the, he's the one who brings you through it. You just follow him. Get right behind him and, and hang on. <laughs> but this is the heart of what it means to be fallen. When you rely on your own efforts and resources instead of on God's. So faith is counterintuitive and um, a deliberate choice that is usually against our feelings and wisdom. It was counterintuitive for the Israelites to not work on Saturday when they didn't have excess food. It was counterintuitive for the Israelites to go into a land full of strong enemies. What convinces us that we need to stop trusting our own resources and instead depend on God and His provision? Well, the answer is God's Word. Read um, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, and notice the 4 in chapter 4, verse 12, when we read God's word or hear it shared, taught by others, God himself opens our eyes to see how desperately we need to depend on his provision. It reveals the discrepancy between what we have and what God wants us to have. It exposes the reason for this discrepancy, lack of faith, and it creates a healthy tension that motivates us to close that gap by depending on God. Our heart is attracted to the rest that Jesus offers, and we must realize that we don't have this rest. And this means we aren't relating properly to Jesus or we would have this rest. Amen? All right. Now, this is what God's Word does. It shows us lack of faith, and it points us to Jesus as the proper object of our faith. Seeing, then, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help in time of need. Now, the central idea is that Jesus is our high priest, and that, therefore, personally depending on him is how we enter into God's rest. You see, we will look more closely in the next few weeks at that, at the Old Testament concept of priesthood and how Jesus fulfills it. But right now, it's enough to know as our high priest, Jesus is the one whom, through, we, through whom, I should say, we receive God's mercy and grace. What does mercy mean? Mercy means not getting the punishment you deserve when the policeman pulls you over for speeding and then lets you off with a warning. That's mercy. He didn't give you the fine or the ticket that you deserved. And grace means getting the favor you don't deserve. If the policeman also fixed your leaky tire and gave you a sandwich and escorted you to your destination, that's grace. <laughs> he gave you help that you didn't deserve. The author is saying that you need both mercy and grace from God and that God is offering you both mercy and grace through Jesus and Jesus alone. This is God's rest. Now, you need God's mercy because you have violated his law countless times and you deserve his con condemnation. You have no resources to get out of this predicament. You don't have any of your own. You can insist that you're a good person or that God won't judge you, but that is mere magical thinking, folks. 
You can rely on observing religious rituals or performing good deeds, but God says this can never get rid of your guilt. Well, your only hope then for mercy is Jesus. Only Jesus lived the perfect life that you owe to God, and only Jesus sacrificed himself as a perfect payment for your guilt. When you humbly admit your guilt to God and depend only on Jesus' sacrifice, you'll find mercy. God will release you forever from the judgment you deserve. No matter how many times you blow it after trusting Jesus' sacrifice, you need never fear God's judgment. It's a wonderful rest to know that this problem is permanently solved. Have you entered God's rest by doing this? If not, why not do so today? But through Jesus you receive more than God's mercy. You can also receive His grace. That is, you can receive God's help that you don't deserve. Now this is not getting God to help you do what you want and then get and get what you want, you know. That turns you into God and turns God into your butler. This is the help that you need but don't deserve in order to serve Him and follow His will for your life. This is God's help to overcome temptation, to have his love for other people, to receive this guidance for today, to comfort and encourage you when you're disheartened, to receive the wisdom and power to impact others with God's presence, and so forth. This help is available to whenever you need it, which is always, and even though you never deserve it. All you have to do is come to God through Jesus and ask him for it, believing that he is willing and able to give it to you. I, and yet I'm going to give you a little personal uh, testimony here. I was going to a church, and, and uh, there, this has been many years ago, but still, uh, their, um, uh, I guess, motto or whatever, that they, they have uh, like a tagline or whatever, like ours is uh, Proverbs 4, 7, and then the first John uh, 417. But anyway, um, those two. Uh, theirs was have a heart for the harvest. Well, I was sitting in, in uh, under the tutelage of the pastor there for at one point in, in, in time, and as I was sitting there, it dawned on me that I didn't have a heart for the harvest. I had no idea what that was and, and what they were saying, but that I cared about my fellow man, but not enough, not in the right way that I was interested in going out while the fields were ripe and, and harvesting the souls. You know, I mean, it just, I just didn't have it. <laughs> so I asked for it. I said, Lord, I don't, I don't have a heart for the harvest, and I don't like that. I want that. I want to know what that's like. Give it to me, please, in Jesus' name. And do you know what? Did he ever? Did he ever? I, my whole life changed. After every time I have a, a revelation like that, my whole life changes. But it, it, at that point and that given level that I was on in, in faith, changed radically. So I'm telling you, all you have to do is ask him for it and believe that he's willing and able to give it to you, and he will. The more regularly you do this, my friends, the more you experience his undeserved help and the more humbly confident you become that he will always help you. God is there with you. He talks to you all the time. He never shuts up. You're the one who shuts him off. You turn him off with listening to the TV or the radio or thinking of other thoughts or having conversations on the telephone with your friends and blah, 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 blah. And if you just be quiet and listen, he'll talk to you. But when you become humbly confident, you become... Uh, uh, and confident in, in that he that he's always there to help you know what that's entering God's rest and it's a life of peace and hope and even joy in the midst of life storms this rest is available to you I want to ask you something are you willing to lay a hold of it if you're not willing you won't but if you are then reach out take it how ask him for it what do you want Anything that you want that is of God, trust me, that's his will. Reach out for it. Ask him for it. He'll give it to you. Did you receive this today? I pray that you did. If you have questions or need further assistance with understanding these messages, please contact me. Now, I want to invite you to join us on Sundays for the Master's Touch worship service at 10 a.m. on Ustream.tv. These services are complete with praise and worship, soaking worship, the Word of God, Holy Communion, and a visitation from the Holy Spirit for those who will receive. And if you, it'll also give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you need more of the Lord, come join us. If you want to bask in the presence of the Lord, and, and, you know, then come join us. God is on the move, and you don't want to be a part of it that is missing. You want to be right in there in the mix. So join us and flow with God. That's 10 a.m. on Ustream.tv on Sundays. 
come expecting to receive. And all of our time zones are in uh, Pacific uh, Standard Time. Join us for the Master's Touch Master Class Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific Time on Spreaker.com. Now, if you want a deeper understanding of God's Word and His will for your life, then these ministerial Bible college-level classes are for you. They are completely complimentary, and if you can't make the class times, they are actually archived on Spreaker.com, on our website also, and uh, that's themasterstouch.org, and also on the website, uh, you can go into the Master's blog as well as our audio classes page, then on the home page. They're all there for your study convenience. That's every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific Time on Spreaker.com. That's today. Come at 3 p.m. Come join us, and come expecting to receive. Now, all of the Master's programs bring you more in-depth teaching of God's Word, and for a full programming schedule, go to our website, www.themasterstouch.org. That's themasterstouch.org. Email us at masterstouchhs at cox.net, poet at cox.net, or mthsprayer at cox.net. When I tell you that you can contact me, get a hold of me, that's what I'm saying. Email me. Email me at one of these email addresses, masterstouchhs at cox.net. Poet, P O E T, at Cox.net or M T H S Prayer at Cox.net. Remember this Proverbs 4 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. You know, my friends, be sure you're keeping Jesus Lord of your life. Okay? All right. <laughs>